Hello everybody, welcome once again. Welcome everybody. Invite people, invite people, share the broadcast. Invite people tonight. What a wonderful time, what a wonderful moment. We are coming again with series of part two. So all those who, uh, thank you for everybody who've been following and uh, who followed this series from part one. So today we are at part two. And I hope that you are blessed by part one. We are continuing and looking about uh, this issue. All right. So, you know, in the past or the, the previous broadcast, we talked about uh, the origins, the beginnings. In other words, we are, we are tracing where death started. And we said that by the sin of Adam, every man died spiritually. And by that physical death came in because you know spiritual death is the producer of physical death but today we'll be looking at the regime of death <clears throat> so invite people tag people mention the comment section so you know as we're talking i'll just continue you know after the introduction of death into the world by adam the reign of evil began when adam sinned the reign of evil began However, as I said in part one, that God had already a plan put forth to redeem man from uh, the, the mess man had put himself inside. So that's a continuation today we are going to look at. Okay, so open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3 verse 9. <clears throat> and the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Where art thou? Adam, Adam, where art thou? So this statement was Moses' way. It was Moses' way of showing us that the relationship between man and God has been uh, severed or has been injured. In other words, Moses is trying to communicate to us separation. Man is now separated from God. Adam, Adam, where are thou? Communicating separation. And I said that separation is spiritual death. And now by that rudiment, it means that everyone who, who falls under, uh, under the, the rest of Adam, that man is a candidate for spiritual death. And that man is a candidate for death. So everyone who would be born of a man would be subjected to spiritual death. And what do I say now? Spiritual death, that's the nature of the unbelievers. Let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 21 to 22. <clears throat> For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made of alive. So he said, through the sin of Adam, death has come. He says, but in the same way, we have a last Adam, the last Adam. Who now through him, all of us, we find the resurrection. In Adam, humanity died. In the last Adam, Christ Jesus, humanity is revived. So in other words, you know, I like how Papa put it. Papa put it this way, he said, Jesus is humanity delivered from bondage. In other words, when Jesus died, humanity died. When he resurrected, we, we, we resurrected with him. So Jesus, the representative of the new race, is uh, the progenitor or the prototokos. So in Christ Jesus, every man is made alive. Right? So we can now say that God never created death. Man created death. God never created death. Man created death for himself. All right? God never created death. Man created death. Now, <clears throat> you know, I was reading uh, Papa's book on, which is called the Spirit, Soul, and Body. You know, he said something very important. He said that, that uh, God did not create the spirit before the flesh. If God created the body of Adam before the spirit, it means he created a dead man. Because the, the body without the spirit is dead. So at any point, if God created a man without the spirit, then it means God created a man dead. 
and that would mean that God created death. That's why you know when you read Genesis, you need to be careful. God told Adam that the day we eat the tree of good and evil, you will surely die. In other words, when you eat it, you will spiritually die. You will spiritually die. But let me show you something. After Adam and Eve ate the fruit, they even lived for 900 plus years. They were still blaming each other. Adam was like, no, 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 that, you know, the one who sinned is the woman who gave, you gave me. Eve is like, no, 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 the serpent beguiled me. But the Bible says the day you will eat it, you will surely die. But these guys, they did not die. They were still talking, blaming each other. They even lived in 900 plus years. And they had many children and grandchildren. So this means that this death is not physical death. We are seeing an, a, an, an explanation of spiritual death. That's spiritual death. Keep it somewhere. So only in Christ Jesus do we find resurrection. In Christ Jesus, that's when we find resurrection from death. All right? This is why, you know, Jesus says he is the only way. Look at Roman chapter, um, Roman chapter 15, verse, uh, uh, Romans 15, 12 to 21. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, so also death was passed unto all men. Now, I want you to note something. Death was passed unto all men. It did not say death passed uh, then it did not pass to Enoch and Elijah. Death was passed unto all men because all sinned. So as long as Enoch is a man, as long as Elijah is a man, death passed unto all men. Right? Because all sinned. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who did not sin in the way that Adam transgressed. <laughs> now, the Bible is saying that there are people who did not sin like the in the same manner of Adam's sin. Let me read it again. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who did not sin in the way that Adam sinned. So there are people who did not sin in the way Adam sinned. That's why I said the sin of Adam was not was not lying, uh, stealing, or something gossiping. It was the rejection of the gospel. Now, what he's saying when he says death reigned from Adam until Moses, even those who do not sin in that way that Adam transgressed, that means these people, they did not reject the gospel as Adam, but still more, death reigned. So who is he telling us when he says death reigned from Adam, even those who do not sin in the way that Adam transgressed? This is Abel, this is uh, Enoch, this is Elijah, this is uh, Abraham. This is uh, Sarah, this is Jacob, this is Isaac, this is David, this is Samuel, this is prophet Isaiah. Every man in the Old Testament, they had death, even though they did not see in the same fashion of Adam. Let me say it again. Let me read it again. Just as sin entered the world through one man, sin entered through one man, and that sin is not stealing fornication, is the rejection of the gospel. And death through sin, the consequence of rejecting the gospel was spiritual death because what? You have refused the mercy of God, right? You have chosen to be dead, all right? So also death was passed unto all men. No preclusion, no exclusion. Death was passed to all men from Adam to Enoch to Elijah. Death was passed unto all men. Because all sinned. Now look here. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who did not sin in the way that Adam transgressed. So the Bible has told us there are people who did not sin in the fashion of Adam. But still more, death reigned over them. Now these people did not sin as Adam. Remember, Adam his, the sin of Adam is the rejection of the gospel. Now, when the Bible said these people did not sin in this way Adam sinned, it means these people they did not reject the gospel. They accepted the gospel, yet death reigned over them. They believed in Christ, in the promise of the resurrection, yet they were dead. Spiritual death. All right? Over those who did not sin in the way Adam sinned. He is the pattern of whom 
who is to come. For if by one man offense death reigned by one, so the gift of grace abounds to all of them, if you read down there. Now, that is, every man born from Adam would be under the reign of spiritual death. Whether he believes in the promise of Christ, whether he believes in God, a man like Abraham, whether he has been declared righteous, whether he has been declared holy, for example, Noah, the preacher of righteousness, Abraham, the man who pleased God, even though those people, they had faith in Christ Jesus, even though they believed in God, there was no escaping of death. Spiritual death was still reigning over them. That spiritual death is what proclaimed eternal damnation. The reason why men are doomed to hell is because of spiritual death. That's why you know you need to understand this before you go on evangelism. That the reason people go to go to hell is because of spiritual death. But now no man goes to hell because of spiritual death. Okay? Why now do they go to hell? They go to hell because they reject Christ. If Jesus had not yet died, if Jesus had not come, if Jesus was not in the plan of God, that means that people who died and went to hell, they would have gone because of their sin, their conduct, or morals. But you know, no man goes to hell because of sin. No man goes to hell because of spiritual death. Man goes to hell because he rejected the mercy of God. He rejected Christ Jesus. Right, you get what I'm saying? So every man would go to hell because he was spiritual death. Spiritual death. Spiritual death. Underline that word. Spiritual death. As we are reading in Romans chapter 5, 12. Underline that word. Spiritual death. And we say this. Spiritual dead people can never enter heaven. That's why you know you need to be born again first. That's what Jesus says. You need to, John chapter 3, verse 15, you need to be born of water, which is the spirit. You need to be born again. That's the reason you need to be born again for you to enter into heaven. You need to be born again. And if you cannot be born again until there is a resurrection of Jesus. No man was born again, whether it was Moses, whether it was Elijah, whether it was Enoch whether it was uh, Abraham, whether it was David, whether it was uh, Isaac, any man in the Old Testament, whether it was Abel, Adam himself was not born again. Eve himself was not born again. In the Old Testament, no man was born again. Hallelujah. Are you getting what I'm saying? In the Old Testament, no man was born again. All right, so it doesn't matter whether Enoch was the righteous one, Elijah was the righteous one, uh, let's say uh, uh, Adam was the righteous one, whether they were called righteous or as Noah was called the preacher of righteousness, all of them, they were not born again. Because born again is a product of resurrection. There is no resurrection, there is no getting born again. That's why when they died, they had to be kept in graves. And wait until Jesus is resurrected. You can read it in Matthew 27, 50 to 54. They had to be given eternal life at the moment of the resurrection. So that means, underline this, before Jesus could resurrect, no man was born again. No man. And that means, before Jesus could resurrect, no man was, was, was not spiritual dead. The freedom from spiritual death has come because of the resurrection. Now, let me not drift. Let me come back again to what, uh, <clears throat> to what I was saying. All right, let me, let me repeat again what I said. Every man would go to hell because he was spiritual dead. And spiritual dead people can never enter into heaven. So it is interesting to note that, you know, sin never takes a man to hell. Yes, stealing, thieving, lying, yes, is it bad to, to lie? Is it bad to steal? Of course, it's very bad to do that. Does it take you to hell? No. Nah. What takes you to hell? The rejection of the gospel. When you, you have rejected the mercy of God, the love of God, you have no other way. You go to hell. Right, you see. So you say, what about a sinning Christian? A sinning Christian, uh, can he go into hell? Well, let me tell you, you steal, you go to prison, brother. And in the prison, we pray for you that you evangelize to people there. 
if you go around uh, uh, sleeping around no problem hiv is there stds are there you will catch them you will suffer on this earth so you should take care of your body let me not say what i, I just wanted to say <laughs> now remember what i said i said spiritual death now does not take any man to hell what takes man to hell is the rejection of the gospel why why am i saying that because you know jesus came and abolished death in other words he came and removed death why the bible says he defeated death jesus has defeated death so there is no way you can say that you know i, I was spiritual dead. you have no excuse jesus has taken the death he has died on your behalf so you can live so choose christ you get what i'm saying now, when a man rejects Christ, he has to redeem himself from going to hell. When you reject the mess of God, brother, you need to qualify based on your own standards. And if now we apply the law, you, will, you will already, already you have no chance. Why? Because the mercy of God he says, I have done it. You do not do it. Simply believe. If you reject it to believe, you will need to qualify on your own. When a man rejects Christ, he has to redeem himself, one, by putting away spiritual death. This is how, if you think, this is why, you know, people do not understand the gravity of salvation. That's why they continue to say you can lose salvation. This is what first you, you must understand that for a man to be delivered, to, to, to be with God, or to have eternal life, or to be born again, these are the two things. Look at this. Let me, let me say this. First, man has to put away spiritual death right man has to be resurrected and you can't resurrect yourself of course and then another man cannot resurrect you now that's where i'm getting where it gets interesting man is no capa has no capacity to deliver himself from death no capacity at all his own death cannot save him and your own death cannot save your friend whether you die you cannot save even your friend no you are in no capacity now let me continue let me i don't know if you are let me say this right so you can get me but before i say it let's go you read psalms 49 7 to 9 i want to show you something why is it impossible for a man to save a fellow man for you to die for your friend or in, or you to save yourself this is why it's different it's difficult psalms 49 7 to 9 it is impossible for man to redeem the life of another man or pay a ransom to god for them for the redemption of his soul is costly and no payment is ever enough that he should live on forever and see decay zebra <laughs> look again psalms 49 7 to 9 why is it difficult for you to save your friend or for your friend to save you, or for yourself to save yourself. Let me read it again. Psalms 49, 7 to 9. It is impossible for man to redeem the life of another man. <laughs> it is impossible for man to redeem his life, or to redeem another man's life, or pay a ransom to God for them. It's very difficult. A ransom, what does it mean a ransom? I put myself in your shoes. If you are condemned on the death row, I say, no, 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 I'm, sentence me, let him go. That's a ransom. It's redemption. No man is able to do that. Why? For the redemption of his soul is costly. The redemption of the spirit, the redemption of the soul, it's so expensive. And no payment is ever enough. That means if you bring all the billion dollars from China, America, U.S., from every, everyone, from every pocket, from every human being on the earth. You begin to pay to redeem just one man's soul. You will continue to pour money inside for all eternity, and it will never be enough. It's like stomach. You continue to feed it. Tomorrow you get hungry, you continue to eat. That's how it is. No payment is ever enough. Why is it expensive? To redeem another man. Why is it that there is no payment that is enough to redeem another man? Look at the following verse. 
that he should live on forever and see decay. <laughs> so it is impossible for man to redeem man because the aim of the ransom is to enable man to live forever, is to give man eternal life, is to give man immortality and intercept him from hellfire. That is, uh, le let me say it again. Let me repeat again for people who haven't understood me. Let me read it again. I feel like someone has not understood yet. It is Psalms 49, 7 to 9. Let me repeat again. It is impossible for man to redeem the life of another man or pay a ransom to God for them. For the redemption of his soul is costly and no payment is ever enough that he should live forever and not see decay. You see that? So it is, it is very impossible to give a man eternal life. Because the reason you are paying the redemption or you are paying the ransom is to enable man to live forever and not see decay and not die. And for you to do that now, what does it take? Let me now get into it. What does it take? Firstly, man has no eternal life. Man has no eternal spirit. So that means it is impossible for in the first place he has no eternal spirit. Are you paying attention? Because the man paying the ransom must first must firstly die, then descend into hell and pay the the price by an eternal spirit. That's why it is difficult. You know, just like I said in the previous uh, broadcast, I say many people when they imagine the sufferings of Christ, they see uh, him on the cross being beaten, blood goes in, they're like, oh, Jesus, Jesus, oh, man. Then when they hear Jesus saying it is finished, they say, yeah, he means that death is defeated. He has, no, 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 my friend. Actually, when Jesus said it is finished, that's when it began. When Jesus says it is finished, that's when the real work began. Why? Because for you to redeem a man, to give man eternal life, you need to die, descend into hell, and defeat death, and resurrect. Now, no man, you know, no man can die and go into hell and defeat death because well, you are already dead. How will you die again? You are already dead. When you die, you will just end up going into hell because you have no eternal spirit. You are already dead. I hope I'm helping someone get me where I'm going right now. This is what, you know, makes the price very, very difficult. That's why, you know, Jesus, that's why God had to do it himself. God is like, no man has an eternal spirit. All of them, they are dead. How can they help themselves? God is like, I am the only one. Then God came. That's why the Bible says Christ, through an eternal spirit, he paid the price by an eternal spirit. And remember what we read, the Bible said it is impossible for you to redeem another man. Because the, the, his soul is very expensive. There is no payment that can satisfy it. Why? Because the man needs eternal life. To give man eternal life, you should qualify to do those things. Die, descend to hell, resurrect. And since you are in no capacity, as you are already dead, God has to descend himself into flesh and die on your behalf. And pay the price on an eternal spirit. With an eternal spirit. That's why you know we say. Jesus paid the price with an eternal spirit. That's why salvation is eternal. Forgiveness is eternal. Redemption is eternal. Because everything involved in our salvation was eternal. Was paid based on legal ground. Right. Are you getting what I'm saying right now? Look at Colossians chapter 2 verse 13. When you, when you were dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, so you were dead. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 to 5 is for you. You were dead in your transgressions and sins, made alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, it is by grace you have been saved. You were dead. Romans chapter 5, 6 to 10. I want to cement it. For when you were without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. So you were dead. And you know a dead man is useless. You can slap him, urinate on him, clap him, insult him. He will not even hear. He won't even respond. He won't even move his finger. He won't even blink. Why? He's dead. That's why for a man 
to save another man, it was difficult because the man is already dead. That's why for God to, 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 uh, uh, to, to save man, he did not look and say, you know, mm -hmm, I'm going to create, a, I'm going to let Mary and Joseph have a baby, then the baby, no, 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 God is like, no, no man is in this capacity. <laughs> because let me tell you, let, let, me, let me give you this analogy. Oh, okay, let me not say it. Let me not say it for now. Let me save it. Let me save it. So we were without strength. We were dead. We had no help. We were useless to ourselves. And God looked at us and he had mercy upon us. And you know, he knew that no one could redeem another man. So he said, you know, I will go and I will redeem. That's why, you know, I say it took eternity to settle eternal matters. And I love how Papa said it. Papa said it when uh, you are reading Luke chapter 24. He said uh, the, the death of Jesus was eternity compressed in three days. <laughs> Let me say, that's my favorite quote from uh, Dr. Bedamin. He said, the resurrection or the three days of Jesus in hell, in death, in burial, until his, until his resurrection, was the whole eternity, eternity past, eternity future, compressed in three days. <laughs> it took eternity to settle eternal matters. That's why God had to come with an eternal spirit to settle eternal matters. You get what I'm saying? All right. Let me continue. Let me continue. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14. Look. How much more than with the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself and blemished to God, cleansed our conscience from acts that lead to death so that we might serve the living God. God, it's clear. He's saying, how much more will the blood of Jesus cleanse us? How much more the blood of Jesus will it forgive our sins? How much will the blood of Jesus save us eternal? Why? He paid through an eternal spirit. Through, an eternal, through the eternal spirit, offered himself and blemished to God. Christ through an eternal spirit. So we know through an eternal spirit, Jesus paid the price through an eternal spirit. Eternity, settling eternal matters. That's why salvation is not, uh, uh, well, I'm, I'm born again, I, I lose it, I'm born again, I, I'm, uh, 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 it doesn't work that way. Once you are born again, you have entered eternity. Because all the matters, forgiveness, redemption, everything, is things concerned with eternity. You think it's just God like once, if God wants to forgive sins, like, okay, you can just do it. You can say, okay, right, okay, I don't take record, no, no, no. The problem is, this matter has to be settled for all eternity. And th luckily now, thank God, Jesus does not give us temporary products. Jesus gives us permanent products. That's why you know I say, I am saved permanently, forgiven me permanently. Redeemed, redeemed, permanently. You need to say it. Hallelujah. You need to let the devil feel it. God became a man. He took nails for man. Oh God. Died on my behalf so today I may live. He died my death so I can live. I can have his life. He was ashamed, uh, shamed by people, beaten. So that I can be set free. So today I'm able to look on the cross and say the sufferings of Jesus that he had has given me salvation. That's the beauty of Christ. He has given me redemption. And of course, you know, as I said, that the huge price was not on the cross. The huge deal was when he said, my father, my father, why hast thou forsaken me? That's when the work began. Because after he died, he, separ he was separated from God. Then he went to hell. Because every man who is spiritual dead must go into hell. So Jesus, after he is separated from God, he died spiritually. He descended to hell straight. Then he went there, paid the price. Then he rose on the third day to justify you and me. So you would say, how did he go into hell? Did he... Uh, encounter the fires? Yes. Did he feel the heat? Yes. 
That's why you know we say that that's the gravity of salvation. And if you want to read it, you go to Psalms 1, 2, 1, 0, 2, Psalms 1, 0, 3, you will see everything. Psalms 22, Psalms 23. Jesus died for my sin. He lived not for himself. He lived ultimately so he can be my propitiation. His life on earth, his death on the cross, his resurrection was all for me. That's why I love the single who said when he was on the cross, I was on his mind. And you know Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane, he looked at the suffering. He says, no, I can't go. Then he remembered you and me. He remembered these people, they are dead. They cannot save themselves. They are destined to hell. He remembered you and me. And he said, you know what? I'm going to do it for them. I love them. I will carry the cross for them. I will die for them. I will enter hell for them. Jesus. And you know the most terrifying thing? was not the beatings, it was not the nails, it was not the cross, it was not the bl bloody oozing, it was not the crucifixion. When he says, let this cup pass me by, if die be your will, he was not saying, let me not suffer, let me not be beaten. Those were mere things. The cup he was speaking was the separation. For the first time, God has been saying, this is my beloved son, whom I, I am pleased, hear him, my beloved son, my beloved son, on the cross, God turned his back on Jesus. He's like, I can't look at you. God turned his back from Jesus. For the first time, the father forsook the son. Jesus was forsaken so that you cannot be forsaken. That's why he says, yo, lo, I am with you to the end of the world. He says, I will never leave you, nor forsake thee. I am with you. Why? Because he was forsaken, so he would never be forsaken. That's the beauty. And the cup that was terrifying him was a spiritual death. To enter into hell for you. To experience the fires of hell. And resurrect on the third day. Why? Dwell on his mind. He's like, I want to save brother so and so. I want him to be born again. I want them to come and be with me in heaven. This is the only way I gotta do it. And Jesus did it for you and me. Not as a coward, as a warrior, a man who is going is like, no, 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 I can't leave this guy. I am going to do everything it costs for me to save man. Those are, you know, people who haven't understood about salvation. They just think the salvation is just a mere thing. I don't get surprised. When they say, you know, I can lose my salvation. I don't get surprised. Because first of all, for them, the sufferings of Christ is the blood coming out. Is the sticks being beaten. Is the cross. But you realize that there is something beyond that. The sufferings of Jesus did not begin when he says it is finished. Oh, many preachers, they say when Jesus says it is finished, they were saying death has been defeated. The price is paid. Justice has been settled. No. No, no, no. When Jesus says it is finished, that's where the job began. That's where it began. That's where it began. Because now he's separated from the Father. He descended into hell. When he descended into hell, he paid the price for you and me. He rose again on the third day. Why? To justify me and you. And the Bible says he broke the wall of hostility that stood between you and God. Now sin no longer stands between you and God. That's why today you can come before God and, and just pray and God will hear you. No priest, no lambs, no sacrifice, no need of temples. Why? You are now the temple of the Holy Ghost. You are the building of the Holy Ghost. You know, Moses, when he was building the tabernacle, he's trying to communicate something. He's trying to say people were born again. The temple is a communication of a man. Let me, let me say this before I, call, I go on. God says, David, build my house. David said, oh no, I cannot build it. My hands is blood. But you know, God was not saying, David, take a word and build the house. 
Solomon built the house. But let me show you something. After Solomon builds the temple, God still comes and says, Solomon, where is my temple? If I was Solomon, I could have asked God. You said I should build the temple. I have built it. I have dedicated it. And we saw your presence come down in this temple. What else do you want? In Acts chapter 7, when, when, uh, when Stephen is preaching, he says something, he says, God does not live in temples. That's where the Jews stoned him. How do you speak this blasphemy? Jesus said the same thing. He said, destroy this temple. On the third day, I will build it. Ha! Huh. Now, the temple is no longer an article. It's no longer something physical standing. It's you. So when, where is the Holy of Holies? It's inside of you. So right now, that's why you can... I love what Dr. Benjamin said. Papa said something very important. He said righteousness is the ability to stand before God without a sense of guilt, shame, inferiority, complex, or sin conscience. When you come before God, you begin to accuse yourself, Lord, I did this, I did this, forgive me. Let me say it. <laughs> I don't know. But people, they need really to, to be taught very well. Because confessing your sins, it's not freedom from your sin. The more you confess, the more you become into bondage. Because while confessing your sins, it's a manifestation at a high level of sin consciousness. David said something in Psalms 130, 1 to 4. He says, if you die kept, if you kept a record of our sins, who could stand from being condemned? But there is forgiveness within that you may be revealed. There is forgiveness. He does not count sins. So what gives you the idea to come before God first and begin to say, Lord, I did this, I did this, I did this. Why? You have not understood what Jesus has done for you. Because when you understand that Jesus died once and for all, he forgave you once and for all. That's why he's not going to die again. Your sins, past, present, future, have all been forgiven. When you realize that, you come before God. Whether you are from doing a mistake, you start. Let me give you. The reason Jesus continued to tell us something, be like children, be like children. The kingdom of God is like children. You know, children. Why? Let me tell you. A child, whether the father or the mother fight, the child will still come and say, Papa, I need food. Not saying, ah, is it the right time? The child will, will, will be from throwing tantrums, spilling things all over the house, wrecking havoc in the house, making noise, you are angry, maybe you slap him. You, he's from the, everything that you think about. He will not go and say, mm, if I ask daddy, will he really give me that thing because I'm from stealing? No. He will come and say, Papa, I need food. I need this. Whether he's naked, he doesn't care whether you are from the bathroom, whether you are busy, whether you are not busy, whatever. The child comes and says, I need this. That's why Jesus continued to say, be like children. Why? Because children have no sin consciousness. But you, when you come before God, Lord, I stole, I theft, I, 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 forgive my sins in the name of Jesus. That's when you begin to pray. Oh, oh Father, in the name. Mm -mm, brother, you are still in condemnation. Why are you condemning yourself? There is now no condemnation. And Apostle John said something. He said, if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts. But I love something he said. He said, and if our hearts condemn us, we, 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 not God, we, we shall assure our hearts before God. So the reason why you are suffering with sin consciousness, it's not God's problem. Even God is looking saying, you are ignorant. You need to assure your hearts. You need to enter, study the scriptures, find what God has spoken about you. Yes, you will make mistakes. Yes, you will fall short. Yes, you will sleep here and then. Brother, stand up again and say, I am the righteousness of God. Once you say that, the devil will say, oh, I remember you are from doing this one minute. Hey, you do, tell the devil, that sin has been paid for. That sin has been paid for. Let me stop there. Let me not enter there. It's a long discussion when we deal <coughs> with all those things. Let me come again to where I was saying. Uh, I said, Jesus deliberately chose to die for you, for mankind. He did not, uh, well, he did not say, okay, well, it's going to happen, or it happened by mistake, by his own decision. 
he decided. That's why he says, I lay down my life. I pick it again. Pilate said to Jesus, he says, you know, I have the power to crucify you and the power to let you go. Jesus says, ah, 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 old man, mm -mm, come back. You have no power over me. I have power over my life. To show that Pilate, you have no power to kill, no power whatsoever. I lay down my life. To show that Jesus, it's not Pilate who killed him. Jesus deliberately chose to lay down his life for you and me. Oh. I mean, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for dying on the cross because of my sins. Our sins. That's why, you know, John says something. He says he is the propitiation. When you look at that word propitiation in the Greek, the Greek word he last most. A satisfaction. Justice satisfied. He is the he last most of us. Not only us, but for the sins of the whole world. Let me come again to the topic of Elijah and whatsoever. <laughs> ah, la gaga, ngalona, sigredi batas. Matula Brende says he had us. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 9 to 10. What does he ascended mean? Except that he also descended into the lower parts of earth. He who descended is the very one who ascended above all the heavens in order to fill all things. Now I'm showing you where, because I know, I know there are some people who it's their first time hearing that, you know, Jesus actually went to hell to pay the price. They're like, ah, uh -uh, you are speaking blasphemy. So <laughs> let's bring scripture. He ascended. What does it mean? He ascended into the lower part of hell. The lower part of hell in the Hebrew is Sheol. In the Greek, it's uh, Hades. It's Hades, Sheol, Hades, sorts of things there. So, but sometimes it's not a reference to hell. Sometimes it's used for. That's why, you know, I say that every word is in, understood within the context in which it is being used. There is no omnibus application to every word. But, you know, when it says lower parts of earth, it's Sheol or he heads, which symbolizes or which is talking about hell itself. Look at Acts chapter 2 verse 1 to 5. Because thou will not leave my soul in hell. Now David by prophecy, by the spirit of prophecy, he is speaking words. Even him he will not understand what he is speaking. But this word is giving about a prophecy about Jesus. Neither will thou let your holy one suffer or see corruption. For seeing this, David spoke about the resurrection of Christ. That he was not abandoned to Hades, Hell, Sheol, or the lower parts of the earth. Nor did his body see decay. So David by prophecy is speaking in the resurrection. You will not leave my soul in hell. Thou will not leave my soul in hell. Okay. Look at Psalms 116 verse 3. The sorrows of death encompass me and the pains of hell. Got hold the pains of hell. I don't know why the English chose to put G A T. Got hold upon me. I don't know what does this word mean. I found trouble and sorrow. The pains of hell. Now let me say something before we move on. The book of Psalms is not a book for you to go and get songs and hymns and sing or dangerous prayers. I know some people they say Psalms thirty five when you pray it all your enemies will die. Oh, let their ways be dark and let the angel of darkness chase them. Let their hands become weak. Uh, let their names be blotted. Sadly, that's what many people they are doing. The book of Psalms, the whole book of Psalms, it's prophecies about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. Now, you will read it on your own time, Luke chapter 24, 25 to 27, and 44. You will see this, I will just say, uh, court fed 44. Jesus says, these are the things I told you, that's I written about me, in the book of Moses, the book of the law, the prophet, and in the Psalms. Now, when you go to 27, you find he, he begins by, by first telling them, you are fools, you don't understand, sorry. He says, uh, let me just quote all of it, okay, for the sake of just bring clarity. Uh, 25 said, uh, oh fools and slow of heart. Now, when you, remember, let me also repeat this. When you see that word slow of heart is a Greek word, bradoscadia, which means dumb. It's used this way. God is slower to anger. When the Bible says God is slower to anger, it doesn't mean he gets angry 1%, 2%, 3%, 4%. No. Slower to anger means he's dumb to anger. He does not understand the language of anger. So, all ye fools and slow of heart, dumb, 
to understand all that which the prophet have spoken. Were not, this, were not that these things should be fulfilled? Which things? That the Messiah should suffer, should be buried, death, burial, cross, nails, thorns. Were not these things written about the Messiah that he should suffer, and then glory should follow. Glory. What is glory? Resurrection. And the Bible says, and beginning from Moses into all the prophets, he expounded into all the things concerning himself. So you see now, Jesus is... Okay. What should I say this way? Let me... I, I know you have missed something there. When he says, and beginning at Moses, into all the prophets, he expounded into all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And the Greek word for expounded is a Greek word diharmon, which means to it's like deciphering codes or to unveil something that has been hidden. Or it's called, or we can say this way in just uh, a simple English, Bible interpretation. In other words, Jesus interpreted the scriptures from the books of Moses, Genesis, Deuteronomy, uh, the Pentateuch, uh, the five books of Moses. Uh, he explained all of them into the prophets, all the things concerning himself. What are the things concerning himself? That the Messiah should suffer, then on the third day resurrect, glory to follow. So when he says, verse 44, these are the things I spoke to you while I was with you. Which things? That the Messiah, the Messiah should suffer, then glory should follow, resurrection. Death, burial, and resurrection. When now he says verse 44, that are written in the books of the law, into the books of Moses, and in the Psalms. Which means when you are reading the prophecies of Obadiah, Malachi, Ezekiel, Daniel, you are reading the books of Moses, you are reading the prophecies about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ, including the book of Psalms. So it's wonderful how people turn the book of Psalms into hymns and worship and what. Yes, there are some things which you know you can get to them. But you know, never ever, never ever first lose to know the purpose of the text. If you know that this is talking about the resurrection, it will, many people will drop their song. Or will stop praying the dangerous prayers from the book of Psalms. Psalms 35. I know because I grew up we were told it is the powerful verse when your enemy are persecuting you, just read it. Then we all of all of them die. But that's a prophecy about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. Look at Isaiah 53, 9. He was assigned the grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Remember the rich man who died after Lazarus, right? The rich man and Lazarus. He died, he went to Hades. Now the Bible says he was assigned with a, gra a grave with the wicked and with the rich in death. Though he had no violence, he had done no violence, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. So those there are scripture to show you that really Jesus descended to hell. It's not something that I just speak, okay? I just wanted to bring that across. Alright? So, if the Bible says that he was assigned the same grave with the rich man, that means when the rich man was saying, Oh, please send Lazarus. My tongue is clinging on my mouth top. Send it on us that he may send a bit of a drop of water on, to cool my tongue. It means that Jesus experienced the same thing. The same thing. <laughs> ah, you know, sometimes when I'm reading these things, I'm like, oh God, have mercy. Because when you are reading, you realize what is salvation. You just see the beauty of salvation. You see, how can a man tell me I will lose salvation that Jesus died for, entered into hell, and suffered there, defeated death, resurrected on the third day. How do I lose that in the first place? Does it mean, Jesus, that he gave me a temporary thing? I'm, well, so today I'm not in the argument of whether salvation is eternal or what. Let me just continue. Psalms 102, verse 3 to 10. Look at this. I said, when you read these verses, because many people, they don't know, uh, what happens after Jesus dies? After Jesus says, okay, he gave up the ghost. They do not know, okay, he entered hell. What was happening in hell? If you want to know what was happening to Jesus in hell, read the whole book of Psalms. So I will just give you a test. Uh, Psalms 102, verse 3 to 10. For my days are consumed like smoke, and my bones are burned as an earth. You see this? My days are consumed like smoke. 
My bones they are bent as an hair. My heart is smitten and withered like grass, so that I forget to eat my bread. By reason of the voice of my groaning, my bones cleave to my skin. I'm like a pelican of the wilderness. I'm like a knoll of the desert. I watch and I'm as a sparrow around upon the housetop. Mine, this King James English will destroy my tongue. Mine enemies reproach me all the day. And they that are mad against me are strong against me. For I have eaten ashes like bread and mingled my drink with weeping. Because of thy, of thy, King James, oh my God. Because of thine indignation and thy wrath. For thou hast lifted me up and cast me down. Let, look again, Psalms 31, 9 to 10. I'm in, distress, I'm in distress. My eyes fail from sorrow. My soul and body as well. For my life is consumed with grief and my years with groaning. My iniquity has drained my strength and my bones are wasting away. Look at Psalms 88, verse 9. My eyes grow dim with grief. I call to you daily, O oh Lord. I spread out my hands to you. Psalms 64, verse 2 to 3. I have sunk into the miry depths where there is no footing. I have drifted into the deep waters where the flood engulfs me. I am weary from crying. My throat is parched. My eyes fail looking for my God. Look at Isaiah uh, 38, 13 to 14. I composed myself until the morning. Like a lion, he breaks all my bones. From day until night, you make an end of me. I chirp like a swallow or crane. I moan like a dove. My eyes go weak as I look upward. All of them I'm oppressed. Be my security. As I said, you know, when you read this, you, you will see what is happening here. And absolutely, these they are not the, all of it. I, I, these are the things just I took out just to show you. Go and read the whole chapters. The whole chapters. Oh my God. The whole chapters. You see it. This is just to give you a foretaste. When you understand the import of salvation, there is no man who will come and toss you in front. It cost Jesus everything. Everything. I mean it cost his life. It cost him everything. It cost him to come from heaven. What do you think now that Jesus gives you salvation then you just lose it? Like that? My salvation is assured in him. I know, I know I am secured for all eternity. Hallelujah. That's why Jesus is the Savior. He is the Savior. He spent three days, three nights in hell. All right. Let me see. Can I give you this, uh, some verse which you can read on your own? But let me just keep. Right. Let me just continue. I don't want to enter into these things about salvation, you know. I will drift from the real topic. I will really drift from it. Ah, oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Mm, thank you, Father. <clears throat> Let me come again to what we're speaking. <laughs> oh, I'm feeling like continuing. All right. So, we were talking about salvation. It's expensive to save man's soul. Right? So, and I said, it's very heavier to redeem man. All right? So, let me just continue. So, I said this. Only Jesus satisfied the legal obligation to pay for the sins of man and intercept man from hell. So, spiritual death in a man can be eternal. Now, if you are taking notes, just underline this. I know there are some of you are taking notes, some of you are not. That's okay. But if you are taking your notes, just underline that. Spiritual death can be eternal, even if it is not. Right? So, if you've been following, you know what I'm talking about. The cure to abolish spiritual death is for the price of sin to be paid. Then the only way to redeem man from spiritual death is to give man eternal life. Let me repeat it again. The only way to abolish spiritual death is for the price to be paid. All right? By an eternal spirit. Remember, the price should be an eternal spirit. The only way to redeem man from spiritual death is to give man eternal life. You got what I'm saying? To give man eternal life. So when I say now that spiritual death can be eternal, even if it is not, this is what I'm saying. 
every man who is not born again is spiritually dead. If he rejects Christ, the spiritual death becomes a permanent state. That's why you know he's condemned. You, listen, God is not condemning people to go to hell. He's not the judging and saying, okay, brother, you, 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 are, you rejected Jesus, you're going to hell. No. We were already condemned. We were already condemned. So that means when you reject Jesus, it's not like God is condemning you. No. You have said, no, 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 I want to go into hell. Because we you are already condemned by the virtue of the nature you carry, spiritual death. It's the one that makes you a candidate for hell. So that means that when you reject the mercy of God, you have accepted spiritual death to be a permanent state. So you are cut away from God for all eternity. However, when you receive Jesus, the first thing, spiritual death, is totally destroyed. And you receive a new nature, eternal life. So eternal life is not substance. Eternal life is our existence. And you don't get eternal life when you die. Right now you have eternal life. First John chapter 5, 13 to 20. I write these things to you that you may know you have eternal life. That you may know you have eternal life. But sadly, many Christians, they don't know they have eternal life right now. Eternal life, eternal life. And by that virtue, if, I, if, if, if really that life is eternal, I cannot lose it. That's why it is called eternal life. For, for, for a better word, I can say permanent life. <laughs> for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have permanent life. <laughs> Eternal life. Eternal life is permanent life. And when you get born again, it's just not something that you need to feel. I feel goosebumps. No, it's your existence. I exist in eternal life. It's my existence. My existence. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. So when you receive Jesus, you receive eternal life. And get this. Should I really say this? No. I should not say this. I should not say this. I should not say this. Let me jump for it. I will come to it later. So eternal life is the opposite of spiritual death. Right? These are the two natures. Eternal life is the nature of the man born again. Spiritual death is the unregenerated man. The nature of unregenerated man. That's why you know some Christians, they still say, Oh, you know, the difference between me and the sinner is that me, I am a forgiven sinner. Oh, really, brother? You are still a sinner? Wow. So what's the difference? I'm forgiven a sinner. Uh, you are not a forgiven sinner. My friend, you are born again. You are no longer a sinner. You are either a sinner and not saved. Or you are saved and no longer a sinner. You cannot be saved and remain a sinner. So to say I'm a sinner forgiven, you're actually contradicting yourself. You cannot be forgiven and remain a sinner. How are you forgiven and still remain a sinner? No way. So there are two natures. There is a nature of the sinner, which is spiritual death. Then there is a nature of the born-again man, which is eternal life. Now, many people say, you know, even if you are born again, you still have the fallen nature away from it. According to the scriptures, when you are born again, you put on a new nature, which is renewed after Christ. That's the, what we call the, righteous, or the, righteous, the righteousness of God in Christ. That's what we call eternal life. I cannot be born again and say I'm still a sinner. I'm no longer a sinner. I am, come on, I'm righteous. Whoa. Sometimes I look in the mirror and I say, wow, this boy, this is not righteous. Look at your mistakes. You are like, oh, am I really righteous? Oh, well, who is a liar? The word of God or me? The word of God cannot be the liar. I am lying to myself. That means I am righteous. It does not factor into my doings, my undoings. I am righteous. It is my nature. It is my nature. That's why if you have a wrong concept of understanding holiness and righteousness, you'll be running around and saying, you know, women should not paint their nails, should not wear uh, certain dresses. Yes, wearing dresses. Yes, I'm, I say yes, dress modestly. But you know, that's not holiness. That's not righteousness. No. No, 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 no. That's not righteousness. So if you don't get it, you'll be running that way and say, oh, you know, you need to be righteous. No, brother. I don't try to become righteous. 
The reason I do good things is because I'm righteous. I'm not trying to do to become. I became first. That's why I'm doing. So I'm righteous. That's why I'm doing good things. <laughs> I'm doing good things. I'm trying to behave well. I'm trying to do this. Why? Because I'm righteous. I'm not pursuing to be righteous. I'm not saying, okay, today I will not do this because I want to be righteous. <sighs> Why am I continuing to bring out of topic thing? I should hit the nail on the head. All right, let me continue. Let me continue. Remember, we are still discussing about Enoch, right? We haven't drifted away, guys. We haven't drifted away. Romans chapter 6, verse 4 to 7. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from dead by the glory of the Father, even so also should we walk in the newness of life. Which version is this? For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this that our old now underline that, knowing that our old man, spiritual death, is crucified with him, has been killed. That the body of sin might be destroyed, the body of sin, spiritual death, might be destroyed. That henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now you, you get this, it's not saying from sins, it's saying from sin. John chapter 129, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, not the sins. There's a difference. When you are reading, you see sins and sin. Shall we continue to abide in sin? That grace may abound. It does not say in sins. So this sin, it's not, it's not lying, stealing. No, 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 no. This sin, it's a type of sin. The body of sin, not the body of sins. And so when you see sin, it's a spiritual death. When you see sins, it's relating to conduct, activities, behaviors. Right. We should not serve sin, spiritual death. He, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Freed from spiritual death. So, uh, so when this verse is about the identification, Christ identifying with us, all right, Christ identified with humanity. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter, 4, chapter 5, verse 14. We are convinced that one died for all, therefore all died. One died for all, all died. He became spiritual dead with us, and his resurrection became our resurrection. He died, I died with him. Remember, what did I say in the beginning? Jesus is humanity delivered from bondage. Why? Because there are two Adams. The first Adam, the last Adam, which is Christ. In the first Adam, every man died. In the second Adam, in the, last, the second and the last Adam, every man will be made alive. So now when Jesus died, all humanity died with him. When he resurrected, all humanity resurrected with him. Well, I'm not saying that every man is born again. Because you need now to partake into it. Why? By accepting the sacrifice that he has paid for you. But in other words, you can say generally that Jesus died for all, every man. So when the Bible says when he died, we were crucified with him. Right? Humanity was crucified with him. That the body of sin might be destroyed. Right. So, at what point does man receive eternal life? Oh, no, we will get to it because that one will be very important for us to understand about Enoch and Elijah. The reason I'm going slowly, I don't want to just speak all the things freely. And at the same time, it's because, you know, we need first to build this foundation. This foundation, it's very, very important. So he became spiritual dead with us, and his resurrection became our resurrection. Our old nature, spiritual death, was destroyed. That, that's what it says in this verse. It was destroyed. Destroyed, not taken away. Destroyed. You see that? And this is a permanent destruction, okay? The destruction of spiritual death is the body of sin. Now, if I say this is a permanent distraction, you'll be confused. You'll be like, okay, how does it factor into it? Okay, let me say this. Actually, when you are reading this uh, Roman chapter 6, you will see that he talks something about the circumcision, right? So, he will, that's why you know, go and read Roman chapter 6, all of it, you will see what I'm saying. So, when he talks about circumcision, 
It's because he has been talking about the destruction of spiritual death. Now, let me get to circumcision. The false king is removed. For those who are boys, yeah, we know. <laughs> the false king is removed. Can it be put back? Whether you cry and said, whoa, I hate myself being circumcised, brother. Cannot be reversed. It's once and for all. Done once and for all. So when you are reading there, you will see Paul using the same analogy of spiritual death, the destruction of spiritual death is the circumcision. Which means that he's saying the body of sin is the first king. That's spiritual death. Now it is destroyed, it is cut away. It cannot be reversed. I just wanted to pass on that to just show you that. It is the first king which is removed. That is spiritual death. And you know, once you are circumcised, always, permanently, not reversed. That's how salvation is. Why salvation is the circumcision of the spirit. All right. Circumcision of the spirit. Are you get what I'm saying right now? Okay. Now, let me repeat again what I said. Because I should keep on repeating these things until you understand them. Spiritual death is what could take man to hell. Okay? So, when it is destroyed permanently, now get what I'm saying. When it is destroyed permanently, then you have a new nature. What will take you to hell? Because remember I said that people could, 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 right? Because I, I said this, the gospel is not a new thing. It's not a new testament. The gospel has been there from Adam. Adam was preached the gospel. Abraham the gospel. The Israelites the gospel. They rejected it. So God applied the same standard across generations. He preached the gospel to Adam the same way we are receiving the gospel. Noah is called the preacher of righteousness. He preached the gospel. They rejected Moses preached the gospel to Israel. They rejected That's why they say, the Bible says in Hebrews 11, Moses saw Christ and esteemed the blessings of Christ better than the riches of Pharaoh. He saw Christ. Preach to the Israelites about Christ. How? The brazen serpent. You can't live. How? The rock which, which brings water. The manna from heaven. I am the bread of life. Jesus, the living water. Moses tried to communicate to them about the gospel. That's why the Bible says, for the gospel was preached first to them, but it did not benefit them. For it, they did not mix it with faith. So God applied the same standard. It's not like he worked up and said, okay, uh, in the New Testament, I'm going to do it by a new formula. Uh, I'm going to introduce the gospel and no, 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 no. and I'm going to bring them to be. That's why you know, if you realize this, someone asks, asks you, uh, what about those who died before Jesus? How did were they get saved? They, they got saved by believing in Jesus. It's the same standard. By believing in Jesus. But how? By believing in the promise of the resurrection of Christ. It's the same standard, brother. It has never changed. Believing in Christ, believing in Christ, believing in Christ. That's the standard. So, now, if sin could have the potential to take man to hell, but the believing in Christ destroys the body of sin which takes you there, what can take you? Ah. Which analogy should I use? But I, I, let me repeat again so that you can get it to read what I'm saying. If spiritual death had the, uh, the potential to take you to hell, I, of course it had full-blown potential to take you to hell. That's why when someone, uh, if you meet a Calvinistic, uh, Calvinistic preacher and so, I don't know, so <laughs> whatever they call themselves, then he tells you, okay, God knows those who will go to hell. If, if you get a question, does God know people will go to hell? The answer is simple. I know one thing. God knew that all men were going to hell. Yes, He knows all men, all men are going to hell. <laughs> right, so if spiritual death is destroyed, which takes you to hell? When it is destroyed, what will take you there? Because remember, it is destroyed because you have accepted Jesus, you believed the gospel. That's why I said the sin does not sin, 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 eh? Sin does not take man to hell. Right? 
What takes man to hell is spiritual death. But spiritual death again cannot take a man to hell. Why? Because Jesus became spiritual death. Spiritual death. And he defeated death. And he resurrected to give you life. He became in your place. So if Jesus now took the spiritual death away, what will take it to hell? The rejection of the gospel. I don't know if I have spoken what is understandable right then. And once you are born again, once spiritual death is destroyed, you become the permanent citizen of heaven. I'm getting somewhere. So, should we say you are permanently saved? Of course. That's, we cannot debate about that. Why? Because the nature of sin, which takes to hell, has been totally destroyed. And you have a permanent life, eternal life. Look at Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. I hope I'm making sense. I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by, 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 by the faith, by the faith of the Son of God. That's why people will tell you, have more faith, have more faith. Hey, relax. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Look at Colossians chapter 2 verse 11. In him you were also circumcised in the putting away of your sinful nature with the circumcision performed by Christ, not by human hands. And circumcision is permanent, right? So if the Bible says you were circumcised by Christ, what does it mean? Permanently. So there is a communication. Paul is trying to use shadows to communicate realities of Christ. Colossians chapter 3 verse 9 to 10. Do not lie to one another. Since you have taken off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self. Right? You see that? Which is being renewed in the knowledge, in the image of its creator. Look at Romans 6 4. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from death through the glory of the Father, we may walk in the newness of life. Let me go first, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. He made him who knew no sin to be seen on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him, right? Righteousness becomes our nature. Look at Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. But our, our citizen, our citizenship is in heaven. Brother, stop praying. Lord, I need to make it on the last day. To make it to heaven. I used to pray that prayer. Every time if I sleep. That though, even if I would forget. Even if I would be tired. That's the prayer I would remember. Why? Because what if the rapture happens right now? I need to pray that prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, please help me that I will finish well and make it on heaven. Ah, what ignore. We are citizens. Our citizenship is in heaven. I'm already a citizen. Ah. Ephesians chapter 2, 9. 19, therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household. Oh, I'm a citizen in heaven? I thought I'm going to make it on the last day. I thought when I die, I will go to heaven. The Bible says right now, you are a citizen of heaven. Oh, so if I'm a citizen, what does it mean where I am right now? I'm in heaven. Now, the moment I say I'm in heaven, you have a problem because you are thinking heaven as some planet uh, beyond Pluto, Pluto, some planet. Heaven is not a planet. It's a spiritual realm, the immaterial realm, right? I, I hope one day I will find time and just go through it, everything. Look at Hebrews chapter 12, 22. Instead, you are come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, you have come to myriads of angels. Oh, you are come to the city of the living. You are not coming. You are not marching to Zion. You have arrived. You are not praying to make it on the last day to heaven. You are already there. That, anyway, that's not my discussion. I pray that one day I will find time to go through that. So we can say the absence of eternal life is a spiritual death. Just like the absence of light is darkness, right? So spiritual death becomes eternal for a man who rejects Christ. Right? You, you, you note that. Very, pay attention to that. 
And the, that's what it takes man to damnation, rejecting Christ. Right. Eternal life is my state, my life, my existence. Right. So I can say that eternal life and spiritual death are permanent states in the sense that both have an ultimate, final, permanent destination. Eternal life, you are going to be in eternity with Christ. Spiritual death, away from God for all eternity. However, remember I said spiritual death is not, it, it's not eternal because you can still change it. Right? God has given us the choice to change it. So, let me ask you a question. So, if spiritual death is not removed, when you die, will you go to hell? Yes. Because it is still there. If you receive eternal life, your destiny is with Christ. Follow it. In fact, it's not your destiny. You have already arrived. Right. You have already arrived. Look at John chapter 5, 25. Very, very, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me has, has everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death to life. Is passed from death to life. Brothers, we have passed from death to life. Whoa, is the something that no do break I have passed from death to life. We are passed from death to life. There is no that's what Jesus says. Anyone who believes in me, even if they die, they have not died. Oh glory be to God. In, on the last day, I will raise them up. Even if I decay in the ground, I know something, brother, that I am going to live billion years. Just like the, 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 the old preacher Bill Graham says, the late Bill Graham said, says, I know when I die, I'm going to die. I know it by the authority of this Bible. I know it. And I will live billions of years. And I would just have begun. Imagine, I would just have begun. What a glorious thing. Eternal life. Right now you exist in eternal life. Right now you exist in heaven. You are a citizen of heaven. You are in heaven. The problem, you, when I say you are in heaven, you are thinking about, you, you are looking around, you are like, I'm, I'm still on earth, brother, you are in heaven. Heaven is, that's why you know. Thank you, Lord. Let me just hold it. I'm not talking about heaven. Please, 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 please. Let's get back to the point. We will talk about heaven another time. This is a statement of permanence. You have passed from death. You have gone to life. Jesus did not say, okay, you will pass to, from death. That, that's the point. Lord, how should I say this? That's the power of salvation. It's the passing from death to life. If it means you lose salvation, it means you have to die again. You have to be resurrected. And if you have to die again, it means Jesus has to die again and resurrect for you to resurrect. Ah! Ah! Thank you, Father, for that eternal life. Free gifts that are bound freely to us. You are dead. You have been resurrected. For you to lose salvation means you should die again and be resurrected. And for that to be possible, for you to be resurrected, it means Jesus has to die again and be resurrected. Whoa, God. I feel like shouting tonight. I don't know. Let me just keep it down. Ah, thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Once you receive Jesus, you and hell will never meet for all eternity. Ah. <laughs> Ooh. Once you receive Jesus, you and hell have no meeting point. Hey. How should I say this? Jesus entered into hell. So that you cannot go 
into hell. You will go into hell. There is no meeting point between you and hell. Never. Never. That's why you know I say, even if I sleep, I close my eye. Even if rapture happens. Brother, I'm sure I'm going. You know, there was a time in my life I asked myself, am I really going to heaven when I die? Those are the questions that taunted me. And when I saw a preacher who was saying, you know, are you ready for last day? Then I remember asking um, one very powerful preacher. And I, he used to be my father, of course. I, I loved him and I still honor him. I respect him so much. Those who have been following me for a long time, they know, but I don't want to say anything. So I asked him, I said, Papa, how are you sure that you are going to make it to heaven? You know what he answered me? He said, I'm a prophet, I know. I'm a prophet, I know. So, for me, who, like that time, uh, I'm like, I'm looking, I'm saying, oh, I'm not, of course, a prophet, yeah? So, I'm not like him. How do I have that assurance? How do I have it? Should I go and preach to be to have the assurance? Should I pray every day to have the assurance? What is the answer? Repent every day. Keep on repenting. But the more I repent, the more I feel bad about myself. How? Then one day I met Papa on Facebook preaching. Heaven is your reality. You are not going to make it. You have already made it. Oh, even now I sleep in peace. Because I know if rapture happens, then I'm left behind. I know how rapture has not happened. It's a kidnapping that has happened. Rapture cannot happen without me taking off. Immediately. When it happens, brother, I'll be even the first to go. Even if I'm snoring, I will go. There is no way. And the, I, I put that post up, I say, when the, the coronavirus came up, we were saying, this is the end of the world, it's coming, oh, the end, what, are you ready for rapture? That's rapture nonsense. So you can search for that post, I put it on my page, are you ready for rapture nonsense? It's, it's there. You will read it, you will see it, it will clarify many things. So you can go to my website, evtfabrislam.org, you will see, I put it there. So, rapture, you, you, I'm not waiting for rapture, no. I know, I know. I know. Why? Because I have eternal life. And you as a normal Christian who is listening to me right now, you should have that assurance. You should have it. You should know. Christianity is about knowing, brothers and sisters. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Papa said something. Let me just repeat it again. Papa said something, said, if a believer enters into hell, all oh, the fire of hell will be quenched. Hell will, become heaven. hell will become heaven. You know, the first time when Papa spoke that, I was like, whoa, what is he meaning? That's why, you know, when you are following Dr. Bedamina, you don't just follow. You follow in prayer to receive the understanding. If you don't, brother, for <laughs> he, he said the story. Papa was giving a story. Uh, was it last Sunday? In uh, where was he preaching? Uh, I don't know. It at, at, at the ministry of Lev Kingsley. He said something. A young man listened to Papa preach. He heard Papa saying the the Bible is not the word of God. Well, the guy is like, yeah, I got it. He went and the word is not the Bible is not the word of God. People they are like, you are crazy. Hey. They began insulting him. I think when the Papa saw it, it's like, yeah, nice, insult him. <laughs> he just said, the word of God, the Bible is not the word of God. Why? John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Bible, the Bible was God, the Bible was God. No. So the word of God is not ink and paper. The word of God is a person. So the, the guy, instead of listening carefully that the word of God is a person, and listening the complete thing, that the word of God is a person, now, when you read the scriptures, they point you to the word of God. They are inspired by God. He just went, all right, I got it. That's why you, know, you need to listen and pray. If you feel there's something you don't understand, well, it's all for me. When I'm following Papa, there are things which I don't understand. I don't say, ah, uh -uh, I this one, no. I open my Bible. I say, Lord, I receive revelation in Jesus' name. I don't say, Lord, please give me revelation. He has given it already. That's why you know I say you got that's why you know you need to get this prayer thing right. 
you should stop praying to God and prayers God. Stop, Lord, please come and do this. He has already done it. Are you telling him to come from heaven? What did he say? I give you my name. Go and cast out devils. Heal the sick. What did he say? I gave it to you. Should you call me again? You can't say, Jesus, Jesus, come and chase this demon out. No, 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 no. Say, in the name of Jesus, demon, come out. Simple. Say, so you pray from a place of understanding the finished work of the cross. You pray from a place of finality, a place where it's done. If you need something, uh, for example, let me give you this, even if it's not a perfect example. If I need, let me say a car. I don't say, Lord, please bring a car. Lord, transport is hard. Mm -mm. Father, I thank you. I receive the car in Jesus' name. What happens? When I spoke that way, power has already gone out and has arranged, rearranged things to bring them to fall into place, to bring my car. But there is a mistake many Christians why they don't receive after they pray. How does it happen? I receive my car in Jesus' name. I'm full of faith. One month, no car. Two months, no car. Three months, no car. Another brother comes and says, Brother, how about that Mercedes Benz? Has it arrived? Say, ah, brother, things nowadays are hard. Ah, I don't know. Maybe it is the will of God to delay. You know what you've done? You've terminated your miracle. Because God needs to use men to bless men. So when you pray that way, there is a man who should open up to God for him to be used, to be a facilitation for you to get that car. Maybe someone who will give, recommend you a job, who will give you a connection to get a job, to work and get money and pay for that car. Maybe someone who, who will come and give you a gift as a car. Maybe someone who will just say, oh, brother, you know, I'm, t you know take this, this, this. Maybe, but, you know, that man has to be used by God. So that man can suppress God and be like, ah, ah. Then that's why the prayer takes long. When people begin to tell you, no, it's the will of God, the reason prayer is delaying, it's because God wants to teach you a lesson. No, 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 it's wrong. You realize the children of Israel could have entered the promised land in two days. But they did not enter that way. Why? Because they were immature. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. So, you know, with all we have been saying, we say that, that Adam, by the sin of Adam, the regime of death came into effect. Right? You noted that, right? So, no man could ascend into heaven by the fact that he was spiritual death. No man. No man. That's why Jesus died to abolish spiritual death. Why? So that you can now have a green light to enter into heaven. So no man could ascend into heaven because every man was dead unless the price is paid. Romans chapter 5 verse 14, look, nevertheless, death reigned from Moses, until, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam. Death reigned from Moses, from Adam to Moses. Even over those who did not sin after the likeness of Adam. And I said the likeness, the sin of Adam was the rejection of the gospel. So when the Bible says those who do not sin after the likeness of Adam, it means this boy did not reject the gospel. They accepted it, yet they were spiritual dead. So from Adam to Enoch to Moses to Elijah, all of them were under spiritual death. Why? Because eternal life had not yet been given until Jesus resurrected. Hallelujah. Do you get what I'm saying? Eternal life was not yet given until Moses, until uh, Jesus resurrected. So, what about, let me just stop from there. Uh, I will stop right there. And you know, let me just stop from there. I think I've been live for close to an hour. Let me just stop from there. Tomorrow, we are resuming Enoch and Elijah. And listen, just continue following. If you do not follow part one, go and get it. Listen to it. Part two, listen to it. Because you know, we are still building the foundation. So it's this little thing that I'm speaking. When we get to an end, that's why when I just speak now, you'll be like, oh, I get it. 
That's the reason, you know, we build, we teach slowly by slow, so that, you know, when we get to the answer, without me telling you, you have already the answer. You already have understanding. Instead, when we are done, you are like, no, 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 that's not the truth. We begin to argue. No, no, no. Right? And also, I, I have a brother, a wonderful man of God, you know, he's like, okay, brother, you know, send me the, the book. I sent him the book, the PDF. Uh, so he read it. Then he came and says, wow, when I asked you to read for your book, for that book, I wanted to see how stupid and silly you were. I wanted to disprove it. But when I read, oh my God, I learned new things. I was humbled and, you know, I realized you are speaking the truth. So why not go and get yourself? Part one, listen to it. And as I said already that, you know, I saved these notes into a PDF. And the PDF is for free. It's for free, right? It's a, an e-copy for free for everybody. It's just like my notes. And it's the notes I'm using. So if you need it, let me know. Just send me a message. Let me know. Let, just let me know and I will send it to you. All right. So I don't know if anybody has a question. We're going to be going. Anybody has a question or something, you know, before we go. And I would love also to pray with you before I depart from this place. So what's your questions right now? Right, let me see. Anybody has a question? Questions? Right, let me give people some two minutes to type the questions. Right. All right, so let me say this. In case you have a question, feel free to leave it there. We'll come back and address the question, right? So feel free to type it. But, you know, before we go, let, let us just pray with you, wherever you are. Father, we bless your name for every man who's watching us live right now. And we thank you, Lord, that the light of you, the revelation of Christ is growing big on our inside until nothing else matters. I pray that mindsets are corrected, burdens and yokes are destroyed, no limitation, no limitation. And I pray for those who are sick, they are healed right now. Infirmities, they are healed right now. From the bones, in the blood, in the tissues, in every part of the body. Joints, heart, whichever problem is it. I pray in the name of Jesus. That all those who are sick, who are watching right now, the power of God begins to move into their body. In Jesus' name, into that area where it is affected, they are healed in Jesus' name. They are healed in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus. Those who have heart condition, they are healed in Jesus' name. Those who have bone problems, they are healed in the name of Jesus. Those who have been scheduled for surgeries, they are healed in the name of Jesus. The next day, when they go for the surgeries, they will find the problem is not there. Ha, 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 ha. ha, ha. Legra dose natabales. Bridinda, 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 bridinda. Ha, ha. La zombra shaka ya mahadia botes. Brano sekaya. Alagase simiada. Thank you, Father. We bless your name for your power which is at work on our inside, which is at work on this place. And we pray that the gospel opens up. People are coming to the knowledge of the truth. Thank you, Father. For we are about to see great and mighty things happening in this day and age. And we bless your name for such things and we receive the answers to prayer. In the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. You know, let, let me just take a minute and thank everybody who has been watching here. Thank you so much for coming live. I've been leaving you a bit over here in Canada. It's already 1 a.m. I've been live from 12 o'clock midnight. It's already morning. So as you can see, my eyes, they're feeling a bit heavy. Let me go and take some nap for two hours or some hours, then wake up again and be ready to hit it again in the morning. Great grace abounds to you, all of you. Remember, continue to study your Bibles. Now, also, if you haven't understood or gotten to know sound doctrine, 
get yourself a teaching priest brother get yourself a teaching priest right get yourself a teaching priest a man who can teach you to understand the word of god a man who can teach you how to read to understand to interpret the word of god and you will do your just you will be doing yourself a favor a justice for all eternity so god bless you you know i will see you once again tomorrow great grace abounds to you in all things this is fabulous signing out See you another.